I'm Norm Sleep. I'm professor of geophysics at Stanford. Now, Norm, you are primarily known as an Earth scientist. Can you tell me about your journey? Uh, where did you grow up, and how did you just become an Earth scientist? I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It's a glaciated area. Uh, outcrops are extremely rare, uh, but the glacier has brought everything down from the north. Uh, so uh, uh, fossils from the uh, coral reefs that were in present in Michigan uh, uh, several hundred million years ago, and billion-year-old rocks from the Canadian Shield, like granites, were very uh, common. <laughs> so that's how you got interested uh, in rocks. I, I got interested in rocks. I had the good fortune to be in the Boy Scouts, where we had a trip to the western U.S. We arrived at Yellowstone right after the 1959 earthquake. Uh, geysers that hadn't gone off in the last 50 years were going off. Crystal Pool was full of mud. I suddenly realized that the earth was active uh, and not just something that had sat there, and that tweaked my interest more. Okay. <laughs> now, I, I think the first time I came across a paper of yours was like in 1989, you wrote a paper like, how big does an object have to be if it hits the earth at a some normal velocity, would it kill all life? Yes. That, you, that was a paper that you wrote that said, whoa, that's an interesting question. So how big does an object have to be to hit uh, the Earth? Somewhere between 300 and 500 kilometers. 300 kilometers to boil off the ocean or leave the rest of the brine in the ocean so Three hot. to 500. And now, how many such objects do you think have hit the Earth from, let's say, from, I guess, 4.5, 6, 7 billion years ago Till today, there's the boot forming impact, which is a, a Mars size object. Yeah, but that's much bigger. I'm talking about smaller ones. Since then, maybe one you can count them on your hands, maybe zero. Why not 10? Um, I don't think you, if the objects are relatively equal size, you very quickly get to the point where the moon would get wiped out. About one in 20 objects will hit the moon. And if you have a lot of objects hitting the Earth, you'll have objects hitting the moon that are bigger than the largest object that we know we know hit the moon. Okay. Now, uh, when, when I asked you about are we alone, you said probably not because, and then you went on to list that there are many habitable planets in the universe. We probably are, uh, yeah, and we have found one now that's already 100 life years from the Earth. Right, so, so let's just... For, Let's just accept that there are lots, billions and billions of these Earth-like planets with water on the surfaces. But that doesn't tell you that there's life there because we know so little about the origin of life. I guess you had to assume that the origin of life is easy in it, order to make it, that step. It occurs fast on the Earth compared to the age of the Earth, which is the, one of the traditional arguments for it be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the elements that I use are very common elements on the Earth. Yes. If it was using some odd rare earth right. or, uh, uh, or plutonium that's extremely right. rare. So ingredients are common. Common. That's, and uh, it happened. Chemical disequilibria are common. Starlight is common. Internal energy from the interior of a planet is common. Right. Uh, and so we're not using anything in particular. Uh, the dish. Uh, to go from a photosynthetic life to photosynthetic life. There's modern life uh, that's uh, electrotrophic. It eats electrical currents. Uh, there's, you take an ordinary zinc sulfide crystal, sphalerite, common, relatively common mineral. There are microbes that could sit on it at the, and eat the electrical current from it acting as a photoelectric cell. So it, the idea of an electrotrophic origin of life, where it's all of it like photosynthetic, but uh, really electrotrophic. There's microbes, uh, there are archaea and uh, bacteria that will send wi biological wires between different uh, right. cells that uh, effectively act, allow the consortium of cells to act as a uh, a battery or a photocell, depending on how you want to think about it. So, so would you agree with Christian de Duve when he says that life is a cosmic imperative? I wouldn't go as far as a comparative, but I would say it's something 
It has to be extremely likely. If we find life on Mars that's not, that's really independent of life on Earth and not exchanged, we know life is everywhere. If we find simple life on Europa or Enceladus that's not exchanged, where exchange is difficult, we know life is everywhere. What kind of aliens would you like to find? Peaceful ones. <laughs> yeah, I, it, we're likely, to, if we find aliens, they've been around for a much longer time than we have, and they, they will not be interested in us to eat. Uh, they'll be interested in our sociology, our science. Uh, they'll be uh, mainly interested in our observational science. It will be a lot easier for them to get telemeter detailed descriptions of how the Earth is working than it will be for them to actually send somebody here. Okay.